So here we are at the back end of April and there's a reasonable chance that you may have already spotted that half the population of the planet is in lockdown as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's having a bit of an impact on this lot. They are of course some of the most valuable and most powerful companies on earth. And right now, as a result of the unprecedented reduction in global energy use that the lockdown has caused, they are all in a world of pain. Every day, our newspapers and television networks bring us a constant stream of coronavirus statistics, most of which are based on this data, published and updated hourly by the Johns Hopkins University. As of Friday the 24th of April 2020, the dashboard shows 2.7 million people infected with the virus worldwide. But that's just the officially recorded number. These companies need something a bit more reflective of real world data if they're going to try and stand any chance of working out how to get out of their current predicament. So on the 15th of April, Norwegian energy consultancy Rystal Energy published this report specifically for the benefit of the oil and gas industry. The report's analysis showed that at the time of publication, there were more like 39 million people infected worldwide, 23 million of those were in Europe and more than 10 million were in North America. And as we approach the month of May, those numbers are still rising fast with no realistic prospect of any kind of widespread easing of restrictions anytime soon, despite what Mr. Trump might say. The Reistad report also shows that demand for oil has so far dropped by 27% year on year from 100 million barrels a day to just under 73 million barrels. The International Energy Agency is warning that the industry is experiencing a shock like no other in its history, and environmental groups like Greenpeace are suggesting we may even be entering the final decline of oil. So will 2020 go down in history as nothing more than an inconvenient blip on the growth charts of corporate behemoths like these? Or could the current collapse in the oil market be increasing the likelihood that fossil fuel producers may find themselves saddled with what traders on financial markets refer to as stranded assets. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. If ever there was a time to use the somewhat hackneyed phrase, a perfect storm, then perhaps now might be that moment for the oil industry. The end of restraints on oil production earlier this year, mainly from Saudi Arabia and Russia, caused a huge glut of supply in the world market. That's normally not a big problem for the oil producers, they just lower the prices and that generally stimulates higher consumption. Hey presto, equilibrium restored. It's been like a carefully controlled income tap for the oil producers for the best part of a century and it's why oil stocks have traditionally been seen as a safe haven for financial market traders and long-term investment portfolios like pension funds. But that fit of petulant oversupply by two of the world's largest producing nations came just before the onset of a global pandemic that drastically reduced demand for fuel, especially road vehicles and air transport, as more than three billion human beings got locked down and global economic activity came to a grinding halt. As demand plummeted, the entire supply chain of oil refining, freight and storage began to seize up, making it increasingly difficult to push new supply into the system. So the oil accumulated in pipelines, on oil tankers and in storage facilities until eventually investors saddled with the physical stock had to begin offering to pay people to take it off their hands. And that's why we witnessed the extraordinary spectacle this week of West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil futures for May hitting the historic low of minus $37. That negative number was in all honesty probably a one-off. The price almost immediately went back into positive territory for June deliveries. And in any case, the more generally accepted barometer of world market status is actually the price of a barrel of Brent crude. But even that commodity has been languishing around the $20 mark for the first time since the turn of the century. Those numbers are unprofitable and unsustainable for the vast majority of oil producers. According to the International Energy Agency, even based on a Brent crude price of $25 a barrel, there's about 5 million barrels of oil coming out of the ground every day that isn't being sold for enough to cover the cost of extraction. That means those businesses are right now losing money on every barrel of oil they produce. And the size of the loss depends on who you are. Even the big state operators are not immune. According to Michael Liebrich of Bloomberg Low Energy Finance, the fiscal break-even for Saudi Arabia is around $80 a barrel, meaning its foreign exchange reserves might only be able to cope with rock-bottom oil prices 
for a couple of years. By contrast, Russia's break-even point is far lower at $40 a barrel. It also has a much more diversified economy, which means it could probably endure these low prices for as long as a decade. So on the face of it, the current oil war between those two nations is not one that Saudi Arabia has got any chance at all of winning. But Professor Bernard Haeckel of Princeton University told The Guardian that he thinks there might be some other method in the apparent madness of the Saudi position. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman may be many things, but he's no fool. He can see the unstoppable global clean energy transition approaching and he's desperate to cash out of the game while he still has the chance to throw his kingdom's fortunes into longer term safer investments. Professor Haeckel argues that the Saudi production increase was aimed at grabbing market share and killing off the US shale boom once and for all. If they could manage that, says Haeckel, then Bin Salman may well start to look for a final exit strategy that gets his nation out of oil production for good. But it's not just nation producers that are suffering, every producer is feeling the pain one way or another. Goldman Sachs are estimating that oil wells producing around a million barrels a day may have already been shut down because the price of the oil is now lower than the cost of shipping it. And they say that number is growing by the hour. Goldman's analysis of the American giant Chevron suggests that company needs a market price of $50 a barrel to cover its costs and meet its dividend forecast. Exxon Mobil is in an even more precarious position at about $70 a barrel for break-even. At the end of March, Exxon announced it was cutting production at its Baton Rouge refinery, company's second largest in the US, because poor demand has filled up the storage tanks. The company also cut 1,800 contractors from the site. Depending on how long they think the crisis will last, some of the more robust producers may continue pumping oil at a loss if they calculate that costs of shutdown and subsequent startup at a later date are higher than the operating losses from keeping the oil flowing. But you need very deep pockets or very understanding investors for that strategy. Of course, if those companies get away with it, then they may see weak arrivals go out of business, which in this cutthroat alpha male dog-eat-dog -dog industry would improve their own chances of survival. As Professor Haeckel pointed out, many of those weak arrivals are likely to be found in the United States fracking industry. Most shale operators have found it increasingly difficult to turn a profit in recent years. In this March 2020 article, one of the original co-founders of Greenpeace International, Rex Whaler, argues that the whole shale oil industry is effectively nothing more than a giant Ponzi scheme. He says the game works like this. Insiders create companies with massive debt, borrow at cheap rates, operate on a negative cash flow, sell shares in their well-marketed, apparently booming companies to a naive public, and then get out making millions in profits and leaving the business to fall into bankruptcy. Whaler points to companies like Pioneer, Concho, Simerex and others who collectively operated at a $40 billion cash flow deficit in the Permian oil field in West Texas between 2012 and 2017. According to Robert Rapier at the industry's news website Oil Price, over the last five years, 208 oil and gas producers and 224 oil service companies, mostly linked to the shale oil industry, have filed for bankruptcy, walking away from $209 billion of debt in the process. Fracking isn't the only desperate attempt to scrape the last dregs of unobtainable hydrocarbon from the earth, though. Canada's got its own environmentally catastrophic folly in the shape of tar sands. According to this February 2020 Reuters report, Canada's Suncor has just taken a $2.8 billion write down and in the last 18 months their value has been cut in half. And also in February 2020, the Canadian Tech Corporation suffered a billion dollar write down, forcing it to cancel a $20 billion tar sands project up in Alberta. Given all that carnage, it makes sense that the larger, more robust corporations have now been frantically making deep cuts to their spending on new production. Projects that these companies would have previously regarded as low cost at around $35 to $45 a barrel now look unrealistic in the context of today's historically disastrous market prices. So most companies are either scaling new projects right back or shelving them completely. Shell recently announced a 20% cut to its spending plans and has suspended its share buyback program. It's also issued nearly $4 billion of bonds to raise much needed capital. French giant Total followed a very similar strategy with a $3.3 billion bond issue. But there's another element of the perfect storm that makes contingency planning even more challenging for these companies. The industry already suffered a major drop in oil prices as recently as 2014-15. To get through that little crisis, most production and servicing companies crawled all over their operations with a fine tooth comb to unearth every possible efficiency gain and cost cutting measure that they could find at every stage of their production and shipping cycles. 
That means that this time around, the jar of Riddle Room cookies is pretty much empty and producers are finding themselves with no choice but to make direct cutbacks in activity. And the pain doesn't even stop there either. In recent years, there's been a major ramp up of investment in oil refineries. Turns out the ever courageous speculators of the oil world brought more than 2 million barrels a day of new refining capacity online just in 2019 alone. Again, in normal circumstances, low crude oil prices don't really spell big trouble for the refineries, but as demand for oil collapses in 2020, refinery margins and volumes are being squeezed in a way that Brian and Colin in the corporate spreadsheet department hadn't factored into any of their equations. That brings in the very real prospect of refinery closures, which the IEA say would accelerate the restructuring of the global refinery industry towards regions where oil extraction is still cheap, like the Middle East, or where demand for oil is still growing, like in the developing countries of Asia. All those risk factors result in the final and arguably most existentially perilous consequence for the oil industry. And that consequence is the loss of the one thing that most oil companies rely upon more than anything else, external investment. The oil price plunge has demolished the lucrative returns on exploration projects that investors have become accustomed to. In late March, Valentina Kretschmar, director of corporate research at the respected industry analyst Wood McKenzie, was asked what the impact of a $35 oil price would be. Her answer was, it's a very, very ugly picture. At $35 a barrel, she said, 75% of projects don't even cover the cost of capital. Kretschmar also pointed out that the rates of return on investment for oil and gas projects have slumped from about 20% down to 6%, which she says is very much in line now with what you can get from solar and wind projects. It is not a very attractive proposition, Kretschmar says. And at $20 a barrel, the industry will be decimated. But Kretschmer says the most pressing immediate question is how long the current lockdown situation is going to last. And right now, no one really knows the answer to that one. In the meantime, scoop down to the comment section below and let me know your thoughts on the current and future state of the oil industry and what you think the prospects are for the future of hydrocarbons in our global energy mix. That's it for this week though. A massive thank you as always to the channel supporters over at Patreon who make these programs possible. And I must just give a quick shout out to some new patrons who since our last episode have joined our Patreon page with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Michael Hasek, James Holmes, Arthur Valencia, Russell Hills, Donovan Walker, and Geordie Fitzgerald. If you'd like to get involved with the channel and have your say in monthly content polls, then you can do that by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And you can show your support for the channel for free by hitting the like button and by subscribing, both of which massively help to get our message out to more and more people each week. It's dead easy to subscribe. You just need to click down there or on that icon there. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so you get notified about new content each week. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week if you can, and remember to just have a think. See you next week.